is Matteo Stati, and he'll talk to us about the mystery of the Mars te Marsh Telescope. Hello, everyone. My name is Matteo Stati, and today I'll be talking to you about the mystery of the Marsh Telescope. To begin, we must head on over to the Aberfoyle Antique Market. So, what is the Aberfoyle Antique Market? Well, the Aberfoyle Antique Market is a very large antique showing where many different vendors show up with many different items for sale. Now, you may be asking, why am I talking about such a place? Well, I'll get into that later. While I was there in 2021, I met one of the vendors. His name is John Vanderkop. He is the owner of A1 Antiques, and he is one of the many vendors that are at Aberfoyle. While I was looking at the things he had for sale, I started talking to him and we ended up bonding together. And I actually ended up volunteering for him several times. During these volunteering shifts, I mentioned how I had a huge interest and passion in astronomy and telescopes. Moving on to June of 2022, I was in Nashville, Tennessee for an internship relating to physics and astronomy when I got a text from John what, what happened was that Aberfoyle is was doing a special Saturday show where many different or many more vendors showed up with even more items for sale. And it just so happened that one of these vendors had a telescope for sale. And while John was walking around as he was preparing for his own um, for his own booth, he actually saw that telescope. And the first thing he thought of was me. And he texted me about the telescope. And he even sent me a picture. As you can see on the picture on the left, the second I saw it, I was in love and I had to get it. And so after talking to the seller, as well as doing a lot of arrangements as my parents actually couldn't pick it up, John was actually willing to purchase the telescope for me and hold it temporarily until my parents were able to pick it up. And then I finally became the owner of this telescope. The seller didn't have much to say about it, as he did not remember all the details, but he said he purchased it from a Toronto estate sale, although he doesn't remember exactly where in Toronto it was purchased, as well as whose estate it was. Judging from the pictures, you could see that the telescope is about a 5-inch diameter and is about 6 feet long. Moving on to August of 2022, I finally finished my internship, and the first thing, the first thing I did when I got back was to take a look at the telescope. To begin, we could see that the lens was very dirty, although there was no scratches, blemishes, or even any mold, so it was actually in a very good condition. It just had to be cleaned. If you look very closely at the top left side of the top picture, you may be able to see a little face. That is because a stamp was actually cut up to use as a spacer to space both lenses in the telescope. In dating this, we could see that it's actually a, of Edward, King Edward VII and was minted from 1903 to 1908. Moving on, we have two interesting features about the telescope. The first is that the tube is actually painted uh, black over the brass tube. This is something you don't normally see on telescopes. And on top of that, you could see the use of aluminum hardware, which is unlike the time of which telescopes like these were made. So my best guess is that these are replacement parts made by a previous owner. Moving on, we could see that it also came with an eyepiece. And inside of this eyepiece contains one of the only few markings on the telescope. And the number in the and the markings is just 1.414. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but my best guess is that is actually the focal length of the eyepiece in inches, because comparing it to a 25 millimeter eyepiece, which is a bit smaller than 1.4 inches, you could, I was able to notice that this eyepiece had a much wider view. And as a side note, 1.414 is actually the square root of 2, so that may pose some significance to, to it. Continuing on, you could see that there is green and gray corrosion on the dew shield. This is typical of old brass. What's also on top of these dew shields are these custom mother dust caps, which are of high quality and very finely stitched. Continuing on to the center of the telescope, you could see there is a very large mounting screws, half an inch in diameter, in fact. 
And as you can see, see, well, not in this picture, but the threading on this is actually very coarse and is unlike anything I could find. And therefore I could have to say that this, I believe this is unique threading. Continuing on, I re after removing the cell, the first thing I saw on the lenses were these markings. And I quickly realized these are actually for alignment, both for the lenses to each other, the spacers for the lenses, as well as the lenses to the cell. So sometime later, I decided I wanted to clean the telescope because it, it was in a good shape, but there was so much stuff on the lens that it was making me worried that it will be scratched up if I don't do something about it. Unfortunately for me, I have no experience in cleaning refractory telescopes. So I had to look around for someone who could help. And after some time has passed, I found a man named Henry Leparskis. So Henry Leparskis is a volunteer at the Hume Chrome Observatory in Western University. And he has a lot of experience with cleaning their 10 inch refractor at the observatory. And so when I started talking to him, he immediately had very much interest in this telescope as he loves antique telescopes. And so he decided to drive all the way from London, Ontario to Milton, Ontario, where I live, to help me clean the telescope. And he brought with him a solution of isopropyl alcohol and distilled water. When putting it in a bath and carefully placing the lenses on top and rubbing off the dirt, it, much, it greatly cleaned the lens. And then after putting, um, rinsing it through with just tap water, distilled water, and isopropyl alcohol again, and finally finishing it on this 10 degree drying sand, which Henry actually made, you could see that the lenses are in much better condition. After that happened, I finally decided that I had to find out just who made this telescope. To begin, I went to one of the lar largest astronomical forms on the internet, the Cloudy Nights Forms. So if you haven't heard the Cloudy Nights Forms, it is a very large forum group where many different astronomers with a lot of experience in astronomy go to talk about various topics, one of these topics being antique telescopes. Unfortunately, they didn't have any clear answers when I talked to them about it. But one thing I did get was a referral to a different forum group, which is the Antique Telescope Society forums. So the Antique Telescope Society, as you can see in the name, is dedicated to antique telescopes. And the people there have a lot of knowledge of antique astronomers and their telescopes. And so when talking to them, I still didn't get any clear answers, although I did get very important information, such as the, the stamp that was used as a spacer, as I was unable to identify it myself, as well as finding Henry, because he was actually a member there. And on top of that, I was able to find out who made the lens of the telescope, which is actually different from the telescope maker itself. His name is John A. Brashear, by the way. He is a very notable uh, uh, lens maker in his time of the mid to late 1800s. But uh, although I didn't get any clear answer on who made the telescope, what I did get was one more referral. And that referral is to a man named Randall Rosenfeld. So Randall Rosenfeld um, runs the RSC archives, which houses a lot of information about Canadian astronomers and their telescopes. And so when talking to him, he referred me to a few pictures and people on the archives. And while I was looking through those, I had my Eureka moment. So what is this Eureka moment? Well, it is when I saw three separate pictures. This picture, this picture, and especially that picture. So when I saw this picture in particular, I immediately got a picture of my own, moved my picture around a bit, and merged them together. And as you can see here, it is a near perfect match. And so when I did that, I finally found out just who made this telescope. His name is Daniel Brand Marsh. So who is Daniel Brand Marsh? Well, he's a very important astronomer for Canada. To start, he is actually the founder of the RSC Hamilton Center, as well as the now defunct Guelph and Peterborough Centers. On top of that, he participated in many eclipse expeditions which are actually funded by the government of Canada. And, and with it, got brought a lot of important information about solar and lunar eclipses. And finally, he actually became a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, not of Canada, but the original one in Britain. So 
Now that I finally have a name to the telescope, I decided to dig a little deeper. To start, I came across the Westfield Heritage Village. So if you haven't heard of the place, the Westfield Heritage Village houses a lot of artifacts and antique items such as buildings and tools around that area of Hamilton. And so when looking into it, I met a man named Peter Lloyd who works there, and he was very generous. So generous, in fact, he actually let me have a private tour of Marsh's telescopes as they actually loaned out some of Marsh's telescopes from the Hamilton REC several decades ago. And with that, I brought my own telescope. And as you can see in this comparison here, it is very close to, to each other. For a comparison, mine is the one on the left. After that, I was looking around. Sorry, one second. Yes, you could see here that I actually found Marsh's gravestone. And so after seeing it online, I decided to go there myself. And this is the picture I got. And if you look just very closely near the top, you could see a telescope, just like the one on the picture and similar to the one I have. What's also interesting is just a five minute drive away from that cemetery is the Hamilton Public Library. Inside of their archives, they house a lot of information about Marsh, such as these two pictures here of the sun and the moon, which were most likely taken through one of these five inch telescopes. On top of that, you could see here in this article, Marsh is actually the first person ever to obtain a perfect record of a solar eclipse. And if you look at the two bottom pictures, you can see the instruments used are very similar to the telescope I have, as well as the one in the pictures. After that, I looked around on the internet some more when I came across of this old 2008 Orbit article. In it, a person was talking about, about Marsh and actually had his email at the very end asking for people to talk to him if, he has, if you have any more information about Marsh. And despite it being such an old article, his email still worked. And so the man who made that article is, uh, is Rob Allen. So Rob Allen is a member of the Hamilton RESC. And when talking to him, he had a lot of information to tell me about Marsh. But the most important thing about, about what he had was this here, a brochure. But this brochure wasn't made by Marsh. It was actually made by his son, John A. Marsh. As it turns out, his son... John A. Marsh, also made telescopes with him. And on top of that, after Marsh died in 1933, his son actually made telescopes in his name that were designed to be very similar to Marsh's telescopes. So now we have the additional question of which Marsh made the telescope. And with that, we lead to our final question, which is, when was it made? Well, we have two walls of time on when this could have been made. The stamp and his death, which is 1903 to 1933. That is all the information I have on this telescope for now. Thank you very much for watching. Any questions? That's a fascinating story. Thank you for coming along and telling us all about it. No problem. Well done. Uh, questions. All right. Uh, I'll go here because it's closer. I'll be <laughs> right back. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Have you uh, considered uh, stripping off the uh, paint and restoring it to its original brass uh, finish? Yes, I have considered it, but I'm not. I'm unsure whether or not the paint's original. It's probably not, but I don't. I'm worried that if I do a permanent change like that, and it turns out that the paint's original, I don't want to. I don't really want to make changes like that. So I'll leave the paint on for now. But if if it turns out that the paint's just uh, from a previous owner, I will consider removing it. Thanks. Uh, Matteo, I'd be very interested to know whatever you find out about Marsh with the Guelph Center. The reason being is that my great-great-grandfather was the original uh, recorder for, uh, when the Guelph Center was first founded. There kind of means there's a slight possibility that there's a personal family connection with this telescope. Oh, that's great to hear. I, I got to ask more questions when we're done here. <laughs> okay, any more questions in the room? We online? Okay, let's go online then. 
I have one question from Leo to Calf. Uh, any idea how many scopes Marsh made? Okay, so there's not an exact answer as he never really documented it. But um, a lot of people I've talked to uh, suggested there is only five of these uh, five-inch telescopes that were made. But I also saw that in, um, it, it was it's related to his son. I think um, that Orbit article I was mentioning that Rob Allen made, uh, it sounded like uh, at least his son might have made 20 of these. So five to 20 is my best guess. But there could be more or there could be less. No one knows for certain. It's just the, all we know for certain is that there's three of them now, two at the uh, Westfield Heritage Park and the one I have here. Matteo, I have a question myself. Uh, one of the slides, you showed something that was somewhat commercial. Were they making them commercial, commercially? Uh, like that, right uh, there. Yes. Yes. So this is his uh, Marsh's son article, John A. Marsh. And so I believe that's where the uh, number 20 came from. So maybe 20 telescopes were sold using from his son after Marsh died in 1933. But I'm still not certain about that. Okay, interesting. Very good. Question right here. Is his son alive? Did you try to get in touch with his son to see if there's any information from him? Uh, his son uh, passed away. I'm not sure on the year, but uh, there are still relatives alive, I believe. Although back in the 80s, uh, there was a huge uh, like um, transfer from like uh, the family of Marsh to the Hamilton REC Center of Marsh's equipment, and then eventually that went round, wound up in the Westfield Heritage Village. So I might try contacting them one of these days. All right. Any more questions? Very good. Thanks again, Matteo. No problem. Appreciate it.